a uh, just a short uh, hope everybody's okay just a short bible study if i get time later on tonight i'll uh, do a sermon tonight so i hope everybody's okay and love to everybody out there so we just have a short bible study in the book of esther so if you'd like to turn to your bibles and um, we shall be looking at the book of esther Sorry about this, I don't use this particular um, version. Shall I get there? No. Here we are. Okay. The book of Esther. Let's come before the Lord. Father God, we come before you today. We give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor that you are our God today and we thank you for your goodness and love and father I just pray for this short Bible study that it would be a blessing and a help and an encouragement upon your people and uh, father this Bible study would help them to grow in the knowledge of you and in your love in Jesus name Amen Amen the background to the book of Esther um, we have in chapter 1 the rise of Esther um we just read a few verses uh I'll just i'll just get a i prefer to use the king james so i'll just see if i can sorry about this it's just that's too small here we are we have, we have a we have a big king james yeah big king james big king james of oh hallelujah Okay, let's turn to uh, Esther chapter 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the days of Azorus. This is Azorus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia over 120 provinces. That in those days when the king Azorus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in uh, Shushan, the palace in the third year of his reign he made a feast unto all his princes and said uh, and his servants uh, the power of Persia and Media and the nobles and princes of the province being before him and when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days even a hundred and fourscore days and when these days were expired the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in uh, Shushan the palace both unto great and small seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace were 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 white green and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble and the beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble and they gave them drink in vessels of gold the vessels being diverse one from another and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king and the drinking was according to the law none did compel for so the king had appointed to all the offices of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure also Vashti the queen made a feast for the woman in the royal house which belonged to the king as orders on the seventh day when the heart of the king was merry with wine he commanded Mahoman, Beza, Habrani, Bigatha, Abacatha, Zetha, Carcass, and seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Azorus the king to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty for she was fair to look on. And it, then it says, but the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command by his chamberlains. Therefore, the, the, therefore was the king very wroth and his anger burned in him. So because Queen Vashti would not do what the king wanted to show off her beauty to his mates, he depromoted her. And that is where Esther comes in. She's then made the new top dog, the new queen, as it were. That's the background of the book of Esther. And then as she rises, as Esther rises, uh, in chapter 2, uh, we see Esther becomes the most popular woman in the land. 
we see that Mordecai saves the king from a plot in chapter 2. In chapter 3, if we turn to chapter 3, verse 5, a guy, a general of the king, of the king, uh, Hammer, is, uh, is, on, is on the move. And Mordecai, who's a relative of Esther, who is a, looks, has looked after Esther, don't forget he's a Jew, will not bow to uh, Mordecai, this general of the king. And so if you turn to Esther chapter 3, this is the great drama of the book. This great conflict between Mordecai and between Hammer. Yeah? So if you turn to Esther chapter 3, verse 5, then the king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spoke daily unto him, and he hearkened unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. <laughs> so Haman, the top dog of the kingdom, next to the king, who's a general, He's telling everybody, you've got to bow before me because I'm a top dog, I'm a general. And Mordecai, who was a Jew, would not bow before Haman. So, the plot thickens. Haman, now, in chapter 3, gets the king to plot with him the death of all the Jews in the land. In chapter 4, verse 1, we read these words. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. He now sees the plight of the people of God. He knows now that Haman is after to kill the people of God and Mordecai is concerned for the work of God. So, we see the rise of Haman in chapter 3 and 4. We see the fall of Haman, the general, in chapter 5. Let's turn to chapter 5. This is just background stuff before we get into three points. It's always good to have a Bible study with three points or a sermon with three points. This is just a general introduction to the book, yeah? And uh, I, I wish I had my notes with me, my John MacArthur notes, because it, it, it's really helpful sometimes to, to read them. But this is fresh manner. This is the, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Chapter five. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel, apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she had chained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said king unto her, What will thou, queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then said, uh, cause Haman to, to make haste that he may do as Esther said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is it thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come for uh, the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. Then went Haman forth that day joyful with a glad heart. And when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him. 
and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, Moreover, ye, Esther the queen, did let no man come with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself, and tomorrow I am invited unto her also with the king. So Haman is boasting, I'm going to be with the queen and the king for dinner, and he's boasting. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high. Tomorrow speak thou unto the king, that Mordecai may be hanged. Dared on then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the king, the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. So he's been invited by Esther to go for a dinner, yeah, with the king and Esther the queen. Haman, the top dog general talks to his wife and says i'm going to the queen and the king for dinner his wife said get the gallows ready we're going to we're going to fry that sucker we're going to fry mordecai we're going to take him out all right that's what's happening there in chapter five this is the background we're getting into the background of the book we're getting a feel for the book we haven't got into the to the meat of the book yet we're just getting a feel for the book So, in chapter 6, verse 1, on that night, on that night, could not the king sleep? And he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told Abigathana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king as orders. And the king said, What honor and dignity have been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. And the king said, Who is the, in the court? Now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servants said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighteth to honor. See, he thinks it's him. He thinks he's going to be honored, yeah? Let the royal April be brought, which the king uses to wear and the horse that the king rideth upon and the crown royal which is set upon his head and let this april and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes that they may be a ray the man widow whom the king delighted to honor and bring him to horseback through the st street of the city and proclaim before him thus shall it be done for the man whom the king delighted to honor then the king said to Haman, make haste and take the April and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Then Haman, Haman, then Ham, then took Haman the April and the horse, and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on a horseback through the streets of the city, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighted to honor. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house mourning and having his head covered. Oh, my friends, what blessing. We, we, we're going to get into a little bit more of this, but let me just get flesh out a few lessons here. God is with you. God is on your side. God is with you today. Yeah. Let's just unpack this a minute. Haman, a top dog general has planned the massacre, the extermination of the Jewish people in the land of the king. Esther the queen who's a Jew, Mordecai who's a Jew, are all concerned and worried about this. Mordecai goes to Esther and says, you, you know, it, not, in, ex, not exactly these words, but he basically said to her, why has God put you here? You're here for such a time as this. So Esther organizes a, a meal with Haman and her, her husband, the king. And what she's planning to do later on, she's planning to confront the king and say, look, 
what Haman is doing is wrong. Save my people. But before that, Haman's all boasting and proud that he has been invited to the king's meal. And he thinks he's the top dog. And his wife says, right, now is your time to get Mordecai. You put a gallow up. You go to the king later on. And we'll take him out. Meanwhile, the king has a dream and realizes nothing was done for Mordecai when he saved him against the plot. And so when Haman comes in to the palace, he says to Haman, what would you do to a prince who has been good? And Haman gives the advice, well, bless him, thinking it's him. And then God, uh, then um, the king says, well, take a horse and display uh, my blessings upon Mordecai. So Haman, who plotted to take out Mordecai, is now having to go around the city singing the praises of Mordecai. What do we learn from that? No weapon formed against you will take you out. I'll say it again. No weapon that is formed against you will take you out. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers. But it says this. Put on the all armor of God. You put that all armor of God on and you are protected. The shield of faith, the gospel, biblical truth, the power of the Holy Spirit, refreshed and renewed in the living God through the blood of Christ. Then you are a mighty man, a mighty woman of God as you're surrounded and protected in the armor of God. No weapons shall come against you. No foe shall come against you. No mighty man, no body will come against you because you are in the arms of the living God and God will fight for you. As you walk by step by step in the Holy Spirit, as you walk in the Holy Spirit, as you walk in the joy of the Lord, as you walk in his presence, as you walk with him and talk with him and walk in obedience to him, the power of God is with you and all your enemies will be scattered. It happened when Pharaoh came after Moses and there he cornered him at the Dead Sea. And there Moses, with the power of God, opened the Red Sea. And as Pharaoh's army came in, the sea came on and they were destroyed. In the time of, time of Jericho, as Joshua led the army at Jericho, they walked round the city and they sang praises and they sang and they praised and they praised and they sang and the wall came tumbling down. You believe in God. You may be outnumbered a thousand. You may be outnumbered ten thousand. One man, one woman with God is a majority. Yeah. You have the living God with you. You have the mighty God with you, my friend. You have God with you. You do not fear no enemy. You do not fear nobody who comes against you. You have the living God. God in all his greatness and power, God in all his glory is with you today, fighting for you, battling for you, defending you on your left, on your right, on your front, on your back. You say, my reputation is in the muddy. He is the God of reputation. He'll defend your reputation. He will take and he will get your enemies to fall on their own patar. Yeah. Them who come against you will fall upon their own petard. Those things that they accuse you of, those things that they attack you of, they will fall upon that themselves and they will be destroyed. Because God is on your side and God will turn it around. Why are you discouraged? Why are you disheartened? God is with you. Did you hear that? God is with you. Who's God? God is as all power. God is the creator. God is almighty. God is all powerful. God created this, created this world. He created this universe. And above all, he is your savior. Who came down in Jesus Christ and died in your place. Died and gave his life for you. Died on that cross. Took your sin upon himself. He knew no sin. And yet he became sin for you. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. He was pure and undefiled. But he died in your place. Took the wrath of God for you. And God demonstrates his love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5. 
He showed you that love, that that great love that he gave his life for you, that he gave his body for you, that his body was broken for you. And if he died for you, if he was willing to allow himself to be humili humiliated, if he allowed himself to die, will he not back you up now? Will he not defend you right now? Will he not stand with you right now? Right now, God is standing with you. Right now, God is with you. Right now, God surrounds you. What you need to do is repent. Any sin in your life, any impurity, any ungodliness that is come into your life, you need to repent of it now. You need to get clean in the blood of the Lamb. And as you get clean in the blood of the Lamb, and as you repent, and as you're clean in Jesus, I know you fail, we all fail, but get right with God, confess that sin, get clean in Jesus, and as you're clean in Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit will come and work in your life. And the power of God will defend you like a lion. And you'll be a mighty man of God, you'll be a mighty woman of God, because God, will be on the move for you. God was taking out Naaman as Naaman came against Mordecai. And any enemy that comes against you, they will be taken out in the name of Jesus because Jesus is powerful. Jesus is God. Jesus is glorious. Jesus is king. You want to mess with me? You want to take me on? You're taking my God on. You're taking my Lord on. You're taking my king on. And you're going to lose, my friend. That's what you got to say. We're, we're, we're warding in the name of Jesus. We're going in the name of Jesus. We're going in his power. We're going in his glory. We're going in the name and the blood and righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Step by step, nobody's going to take us out because we're going in the name of Jesus. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. They might cut our heads off. Do you remember John the Baptist? He spoke the word of God out and what did they do? <clears throat> they took him out. They took his head off. Yeah. You remember the apostle Paul? He was persecuted. Uh, first, first season of persecution. And then near the end of his life, he had another season of persecution. They put him in prison. He couldn't go anywhere. Most people abandoned him. And tradition has it that he was taken out by the emperor and he was killed. But you know what? It doesn't matter if, if our blood runs in the streets of Iraq. It doesn't matter if our bloods run in the streets of Syria. It doesn't matter where our blood runs. It doesn't matter what the men are due to us. It doesn't matter whether they cut our heads off because we are the seeds of the martyrs. We are the seeds and we are the soldiers of Christ and we are willing to lay our lives down for the gospel. And it doesn't matter if they kick us, beat us, kill us. The word of God is living and abiding and it will bear fruit whether we're dead or alive. We are on the living side, my friend. We are on the living side. So rejoice. And stand tall, brother. Stand tall, sister. Why are you cowering against the enemies? Why are you cowering against those who will mock God? Why are you cowering at those who reject the word of God? Those who will come into the church and try to stop the word of God being preached. Why do you cower? We should not cower. We have a mighty God. We have a mighty God. Yeah? We have a mighty God. We have a mighty God. Say it. We have a mighty God. And walk with God today. Point one, the need of courage. Four and a, verse four, chapter 4, verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province do know that whoever, whether a man or woman, shall come into the king, into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live but i have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days there was from the first point the courage of esther the need of courage we need courage there was a crisis haman had plotted to kill the jewish people she needed to go to the king and talk to him about this crisis. Now, here's the point. Anybody who went to the king, if he did not hold out his scepter, that person would be killed. So when she went to talk to the king, she could have been killed. She had courage. She had courage. 
<clears throat> let us turn. Sorry about this. Let us turn. Let us turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Turn to Joshua chapter 1. Verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the hand which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Verse 9. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Be strong. Be strong. Be courageous. Have you been called as a pastor and you're working in a church and you're wondering in the first few years of your ministry in the church what's going to happen? Be strong. If you're undertaking in your marriage and you're wondering how your new marriage is going to take place, be strong. If you're embarking on a new ministry, it be strong. If you're up against it and experienced opposition in your ministry, be strong. If you've been in ministry for a while and you're tired and discouraged, be strong. If you're experiencing persecution in your city, your town, your country, be strong. Be strong and courageous. Be bold. Be bold and strong. Deuteronomy 31 6. Deuteronomy 31 6. Deuteronomy 31 6. Come on now. Get your Bibles out. We're studying the Word of God and you're sitting there with no Bible. Get a Bible out. Deuteronomy 31 6. Come on. These are the last days. What are you doing? Asleep. Wake up. Deuteronomy 31 6 be strong and of good courage fear not nor be afraid for them for the Lord thy God he it is that doeth go with thee it is sorry be strong and of good courage fear not nor be afraid of them for the Lord thy God he it is that doth go with thee he will not fail thee nor forsake thee He's not going to fail you and he's not going to forsake you. He's going to meet your every need. He's going to meet every need that you have. He's going to supply all your needs. He's going to supply all your needs. Yeah. Stop moaning about, I can't afford to do this. I can't afford to do that. Uh, he's supply your need. I need this. I need that. He'll supply your need. Be strong and courageous. Proverbs 3.23. Come on, brothers. I know you're loving it. Come on, sisters. Get into that word. Get your Bible out. It's time to get into the word of God. Proverbs 3.25. I haven't got much time left. I've got to go in a minute. So come on. Get the word. Get your Bibles out. I know where everything is. Yeah. Proverbs 325. Proverbs 325. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Verse 26. For the Lord, for the Lord shall be thy confidence. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. The Lord will keep you, my friend. Be, be courageous. I'll say it again. The Lord will keep you. I'll say it again. The Lord will keep you. Be courageous. 
you can go into battle for the Lord. You can go into an inner city and take that city for Jesus. You can go into a drug den. You can go into a prostitution den. You can go into a pastor where it is barren and they don't want to know your word. You can go into a difficult situation and you can tell, you can know that your God will not let you be taken. He will stand with you in the gap as you go forward in ministry for him, wherever you go, whatever you do for him. He will stand with you. You've got the resources of heaven right now with you. You've got the resources of heaven right now with you. If your ministry is struggling for finances. You've got God with you right now. He will provide for you. Every need, every challenge, every challenge and need that you have, your God is with you and he will meet your need. He will supply your need. He will give you backup. Yeah, backup. All the backup that you need is coming your way. All the backup that you need is right coming right now with you. He's going to send all his angels down right now to protect you. All his angels right now to be by your side. You're being backbited at people backbiting at you, people pulling you down, people disrespecting you, whatever it is. Backup is coming. Backup is here. God is here. He's with you right now. Yeah. Oh, he is with you. I cannot say this enough. He is with you right now. So you do not be dismayed. You do not be discouraged. You do not have your head down in the in the foot, in the mud. You lift your head up high because your God is with you. Yeah. Faint hearted soul. The soul that is faint hearted and discouraged today. Lift your head up high. For he is with you. Walk in holiness and purity. Walk in the holiness and purity of the Lord. And the Lord will be with you. Walk in disobedience and you're like a car that has no engine. You will go nowhere. You walk in disobedience and you will go nowhere. You will not have backup. If you are walking in disobedience, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not not give you the backup that you need because you are grieving him so you pack in any sexual immorality you pack in anything that is not right with the lord any hatred anything that you have got in your heart you pack it in and you pack it in right now and you deal with it right now you get right with your lord and when you get right with your lord and as you come under the blood of the lamb and as you come washed in the blood and washed in the jesus and as the spirit of god comes in you and refreshes you and renews you you will have all the backup that you will ever dream of all the backup that you could ever dream of god is coming to your side yeah hallelujah you need courage number two esther and her home esther chapter 4 verse 12 and 14. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words that Mordecai commanded to, to answer Esther, think not what with thyself that thou should escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall the enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the king for such a time as this? Mordecai is saying to him, look, you haven't been made queen by accident. You're there for a purpose. You're there for a reason. For such a time as this, the people of God are in crisis. You are here for a purpose, Esther. And you've got to exercise your faith, is, is what Mordecai is saying, and, and, and act in this season. You've got to do that. Yeah? Esther was able to deal with the crisis that her people were under because she knew where she was. You've got to know where God wants you if you're going to be able to stand in a crisis situation. Let's imagine you're called to be a missionary to China or to India. And it goes wrong in India. Let's say you've been called to go to India and you know that God has called you to India and you go to India to be a missionary and it's all going wrong. Everything seems to be going wrong. If you know that God has called you to India 
then God is going to back you up. He will be with you because he sent you there. So he's got to supply your need. But let us say that God has called you to go to India, but you just disobey him. And you decide to set up a business and be a multimillionaire. And as you set up a business, the business goes wrong. You're not going to get the backup from God because you're walking out of this. You're walking in disobedience. You're not where you're supposed to be. Or maybe you are called to be a multimillionaire. You're called to run a business, but you've disobeyed your call and decided to go and be a missionary. And you've gone to a place that God never told you to go to. And it, you go there and it goes all wrong. You're, and, and, you're, and God doesn't seem to be with you. And it's all because you've walked out of disobedience. The same in the marriage. You, you need to know that God is with you in the marriage. That that's what God wants for you. That, that That's God's call for you. Make sure you know where God wants you to be. If you go to a church to, to fellowship in a church or work in a church, or if you're working alongside people doing things for the Lord or in your secular employment or wherever, you need to know that that is where God wants you. Ask God, God, is this where you want me to be? The reason why Jeremiah could cope, the reason why Moses could cope, the reason why David could cope, the reason why Paul could cope and Peter is they knew where God wanted them to be. They heard the call and they obeyed. And when it got difficult, they could count upon God because they knew where God wanted them to be. Are you where God wants you to be? Have you gone outside the will of God? Have you decided to do something or go in a direction that you know God did not want you to go down? Then you're not going to get the backup that you need. You need to move in the in the will of God. You need to hear the will of God for your life. You need to say, Lord, what is your will for me? What is your purpose for me? Do you want me to be a preacher? Do you want me to be a pastor? Do you want me to be a youth worker? Do you want me to be a solicitor, a nurse, or a teacher, or a milkman, or a postman? What is it, Lord, that you want me to do? Do you want me to marry this person or not? Do you want me to do this? Do you want, Lord, what is your will? And follow his will. And as you are in the will of God, doing what God wants you to do, then you can count on God to back you up. So you need courage and you need to know where God wants you. She knew that her home was in the palace with the king. And that's where God wanted her to be. Third, Esther and her people. She loved the people of God. Esther chapter 4, verse 16. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. And also on my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. She's saying to the people of God, look, we're in a crisis. Haman wants to kill you all. If I go and see the king, he could kill me because... If anybody goes and sees him, he can do that sometimes. But you all fast and pray. And as you fast and pray, I will go in at this crisis time and I will talk to the king on your behalf. So pray for me. Do you know something? She loved the people of God. She put her reputation, her comfort, her needs last. And she put the people of God's needs first. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian, said this. In his book, Life Together, and I've never forgot this. And he said this, some people see church as their salvation. And he was saying that as a criticism. I'll, re I'll say that again. Some people see church as their salvation. They go to church and they think that church is about their need and the church has to meet their need. I'm here in church. Meet my need. You meet my need. You meet my need. Me, 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 me. And it's all about me, 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 me. I need this. I need that. I want this. I want that. Like a baby who wants a dummy. Uh, uh, uh. Give me me dummy. Give me me dummy. Uh, 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 uh. And it's me, 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 me. When they get to church. My problems, my needs. Me, 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 me. Uh, 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 uh. Give me a dummy. Yeah? Esther was not one of those people. They went around going, me, 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 give me a dummy. 
She was a person who thought about the people of God. She loved the people of God above herself. When you go to church, do you go to say, me, 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 meet my needs. It's all about me, 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 me. Or do you go to church to love your brethren? Do you love them more than yourself? Are you willing to put yourself out for them? She loved the church. She loved the people of God more than she loved herself. Do you? You're, you're, you're bothered about your career and how much money you're making as a Christian. And you're, and you're running around about your career. And yet there's a brother at church or a sister at church that can't get to church on time because they're getting buzzes. And you've got a car and you haven't thought to give them a lift because you're so consumed with your career. You've got a brother or sister who's struggling in their home for whatever reason, and you never thought to ask how they are because you're so busy about your career, about your family, about your needs, about you, and you don't think about anybody else in the church. It's all about you. Yeah? Who do you love? Do you love the people of God? Do you love the cause of God? Do you love the cause of God? Why did you become evil? You believe because Jesus died for you on the cross. You believe because he, he gave his life for you. So why have you settled down? In your retirement, you, you're collecting shells. You're collecting stamps. In your retirement, you're doing this. You're enjoying your retirement. And yet all the time, the work of God is being neglected. People are not being visited. Sermons are not being preached. Children's work's not being done. Evangelism's not being done because you've retired and you're collecting shells shells died because you're collecting stamps you've retired chill you've gone on a cruise and the work of god has gone neglected because you love yourself more than the kingdom of the lord you love yourself and your comforts more than the people of god you love yourself more than the lost who are dying and going to hell what are you doing in your retirement what are you doing in your retirement for goodness sake and you who've got a family and you who've got a career and you're doing fine and you've got a big house, you've got money, you're doing fine and it's all glory, glory, glory. God has blessed me. How wonderful I am. What are you doing for the kingdom of God? Are you giving some of your money to the people of God? Are you giving it so the pastor can have a decent salary? What are you doing? Why are you wasting God's resources? Why are you wasting God's time? These are the end days. These are the end days. You should be willing to sacrifice. You should be willing to use your career, the finances that you're getting to, to empower the people of God. If you're, the, if you're wealthy or if you're doing well, empower the people of God and give money to the work of God. Instead of storing it up for yourself to make yourself look good in church. Look at me. I've got a big house. Look at me. I've got a big car. Look at me. I'm doing well. Aren't I good? No, 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 no. It's time you woke up. It's time you realize the people of God need you. The people of God are crying out for you. And then there are some of you there and you're going around with a pity party all the time. I know you're broken. I understand. I understand you've been broken. I understand that you've been in pain. I understand. But there's a time to cry and there's a time for joy. There's a time to be down and there's a time to be up. And it's time that you went up and rather than down. It's time you start having a pity party and it's time you start helping those around you thinking about their needs. We can be so consumed with ourselves that we forget about other people. I know that you're lonely. I know that you got needs. I know that you're struggling. But if you put the work of God first, if you put the people of God first and the needs of the others first, you will not be as unhappy as you are. You will have a better life and a happier life if you stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about those in the church who need you. Do you love the people of God more than yourself? Esther loved the people of God more than herself. So she had courage and she loved the people of God. Third, she, she, she had courage. She knew where she was, where God had called her. And thirdly, she was a woman who love the people of God. For Esther under God. In this book. Esther believed. And trusted God. When she went in. 
to the king and said, can I make you a meal and ham and a meal? And she made them a meal. And then when she made them a meal, she then turned around to the king and said, this guy is plotting against my people. We sought him out. All that took faith. She had faith in God. You know, God's not mentioned anywhere in this book, yet God is everywhere in this book. That's amazing. Because the providence of God was moving. And we see that where Haman prepares the gallows to take out Mordecai and yet God turns it around and Mordecai is the one who's blessed and Haman ends up on the gallow that he prepared for Mordecai. That is the mighty God working for Esther and her people. She believed in, the, in God. God does dramatic interventions. He does great things. Let's turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Yeah, some of you are saying, oh, I, I like this preaching. I like this preaching. We'll get into our church. We'll, we'll get into preaching at our conference. No, 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 no. You go and preach like this. You go and preach like this. You don't need me to come and preach for you. You go and preach. You only need to do two things. Number one, live a holy life. Cut all the sin out of your life. And number two, step out in faith. And the Spirit of God will come upon your ministry. You don't need me to come to your church. You go preach in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. You do it. It can be done by you. Now go. You don't need me. All right? You do it. You set your nation on fire. You set your city on fire. You set your town on fire by living a clean life and depending on the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can do the same thing as I'm doing today because it's not me. It's of God. God is on the move. God is on the work. We give him the glory. He does it, not us. He's the one who does it, not us. Yeah? So you go and do it as well. All right? We give him the glory. Luke eleven thirteen. Luke eleven thirteen. Have you got your Bible up? Come on. It says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Ooh. God is a God is a good God. He's a good God. And as we're obedient, my uncle's here. As we're obedient, the power of the Holy Spirit will come. The power of the Holy Spirit will come. Esther believed that God was a God of intervention. She believed in trusting God. God can break in and change your family. It can change your church. It can change your community. Believe that God is a God who can do great things. And he'll do great things for you. We're going to close in prayer. My uncle's here and I've, I've got a... Uh, go to chapel. And um, so I've got to close in prayer. So I'm just going to close in prayer. And uh, I might do a sermon later on tonight. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we come before you today. And Father, we give you the prayers and the glory and the honor today. That you are our God, that you are our Savior and our Lord. And we praise you and worship you today and give you the glory. We pray, Father God, that you would refresh each person who hears these words today. May they be renewed and strengthened and encouraged. May they be blessed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for your glory. Amen. Amen. So have a read of the book of Esther today and pray over it and study it. And may God bless you. All right. Take care. Got to go.